Welcome to the Unitarian Christian Alliance podcast, episode 78, Success, Hubris, and the Titanic, with guest Rex Kane. He was my father and my pastor. I have many reasons to be excited and hopeful about this UCA effort. You can't keep truth down. Truth is like an anti-cancer that constantly gnaws away and displaces error. But yes, there are ways to suppress truth. Like cancer, you can inject poison into it. You can cut it out. You can blast it with heat or cold. Cancer may seem a morbid parallel, but this is the Harsh Reality episode, and I know we can handle it. Truth, specifically here, the truth that God is one, that he is the Father, and that he is the only God, which is the explicit teaching of Jesus. At one time, this was the theological framework of Christianity. Even those non-Jewish church fathers of the first few hundred years, who might, in Greek fashion, refer to Jesus with the title God, even they were still in agreement with who the one ultimate God was, and it wasn't Jesus. <laughs> Today that fact is known, though rarely discussed, and that is why we have fuzz words like proto-Trinitarian to qualify that early era. They were uh, close to correct, didn't have a co-equal tripersonal God yet, but that's okay. They used the word God on Jesus, and that's all we need to see. Move along. Sean Finnegan talks about the use of the word God in his UCA presentation from 2023, and it's a great listen if you want to understand early, quote, God usage. Find it on his Restitutio podcast or the video on the UCA YouTube channel. It didn't take long for the faith to start morphing. It became less and less Jewish, another well-attested fact. And why this isn't a red flag to most of Protestantism, I don't know. So originally, the cancer came from things like Platonism and Greek thinking. Then it eventually consumed the theology of the church. That then became the body and the Jewish mindset of Davidic lineage and God's working and speaking through human representatives. That outdated idea was like the vestigial appendix dangling around in the body to be occasionally pondered, and if it became painful, to be extracted violently. And here we are today. This truth about one God has been so overrun by speculations, traditions, and the juggernaut of critical mass inertia, episode 67, Why is the Trinity Mainstream?, that now the truth is perceived as the cancer. It's dangerous and scary, certainly not something you should be pondering. No, don't. It reminds me of a guy I knew from years ago who had terrible dietary habits, like terrible. It finally dawned on him that he should eat more than just pizza. And one day he ate some broccoli and it made him wretchedly sick. Anyway, as we find success here, with thousands upon thousands of people realizing it's okay to not be Trinitarians, and more people speaking up about it, this success will not go down smoothly. There will be a reaction, and it will not be pretty. But it will happen, and I want you to recognize that success isn't going to look particularly lovely. There will be apologists who decry the ruination of the faith. There will be efforts to thwart it, to sabotage it. Hit pieces, character attacks. There will even be people similar to Jonah, so wrapped up in their one God identity that they will be resentful that others are now coming into the fold. Resentful that what made them special won't be so special anymore. It will get ugly. And to be charitable, it's not like the ugliness is simply because these people are evil. Not at all. It's the human reaction to uncertainty and change. We can be unpleasant when we get scared or when our internal thoughts begin to become uh, dissonant. We just need to be ready 
and not surprised. We will need patience and the willingness to forgive for what will transpire. Which brings me to the Titanic. My dad, Rex Kane, died in December 2017, just over six years ago. He was a pastor for 50 years in the Church of God General Conference, a biblical Unitarian group with roots going back over a century. My dad's favorite extra-biblical topic was the Titanic. He wrote his first sermon on the disaster 41 years ago. I remember hearing him preach it at 11 years old. It wasn't every day an 11-year-old boy heard about gruesome disasters, death tolls, and flooding bulkheads from a pulpit. It stood out. Now, Rex had a terrible childhood. His parents were not up to the task, and the fallout landed on him, crushing his young soul, mashing his self-confidence. If it wasn't for a few kind people in his life who invited him to a small church on the outskirts of Springfield, Ohio, he might not have ever experienced selfless, genuine, godly love. But a few kind people did bring Dad along to church, and there he saw another side of life. After graduating high school, not knowing what to do, he decided to enlist in the military. He was getting into the car to go and sign the paperwork when the pastor of the church called. A few seconds later, he would have driven away and signed himself into the service, and life would have been um, much different for me. But he came back into the house to take the call, and the pastor suggested he consider going to Bible college. The Church of God General Conference has a college, now called Atlanta Bible College, and he decided to do that instead. One small decision, and Rex ended up becoming a pastor and marrying a lovely Christian woman, Grace. I think that for my dad, decisions had a powerful magnetic pull in his mind. When he started his family, for example, he made the decision it would not be anything like what he grew up with. Just that decision alone has produced a few generations of Cain descendants, involved in the faith, participating in ministry, active in their communities, hosting a goofy podcast. My dad caused that based on one simple decision, not in my family. How do you make good decisions? How significant will this decision or that decision be? Well, they can be huge. I know of dozens of Rex's expanded family who owe a great deal of gratitude for the small decision someone in Springfield, Ohio made when they said to the sad and hurt little boy, Rex, why don't you come along to church with me? We cannot know the impact of each choice we make, but do not underestimate their power. I think that's a big reason my dad was fascinated with the Titanic. The layers of poor decisions manifested in this one event, they're nearly overwhelming. How can people be so blind, so foolish, so self-possessed and confident? How? <laughs> it's a tale of our weakness. The question should not be, how does this happen? It should be, when it happens again, how can we not be a part of the devastation? And it will happen. Failures, human weakness, mistakes, pride, jealousy, those negative things will invade our lives at various points, and we would do well to be ready to step back and seek God's guidance rather than fall into the spiraling vortex of anger, hurt, and resentment that will suck the life out of us. But you know what else can happen? Success. There are two parts to the Titanic story, the decisions that brought the disaster and the decisions that bubbled out of success. It was the rapid onset of industrial and financial prosperity around the start of the 1900s which presented the world with so many options, so much possibility. Success is just as fertile a soil for foolish decisions as is suffering and difficulty. 
I truly believe that this effort here of the UCA is simply one of the many shoots that are springing up from the root of the original faith, once for all delivered to the saints. It's not that this one doctrine is somehow magically making good people out of bad, bringing peace where there is war, etc. It's not the good news of Jesus and the message of God's kingdom. It's just a simple clarity on who our God is and what he was actually preparing to do when he promised Moses that a future prophet would eventually arrive on the scene and one we should listen to closely. This one particular contentious and difficult theological discussion just turns out to be a terrible source of division and confusion. Long ago, the cancer took over the theological body, and now this Trinitarian body is not doing very well. The anti-cancer is spreading. The truth is metastasizing, and it's ready to start showing some obvious symptoms soon. Here, in terms of success, just in the last month, we've released Dale Tuggy's short videos on the Trinity and some short clips promoting the podcast. These, and you sharing them, have tickled the magic that is the YouTube algorithms, and vastly larger number of peoples are seeing and hearing about our one God than ever before. In the last month, we've seen a 20-fold increase in views, a four-fold increase in time spent watching, and 30,000 new viewers that had never seen the UCA channel before. More on this at the end. And then we've selected the dates and location for our first UCA conference in Europe, the UCA UK International Conference, July 25 through 27 in Windsor, UK. More on that at the end. And then Dale Tuggy is part of a Four Views book that is on its way to the publishers. See the previous episode. This is all very exciting. And this is what success looks like. More people talking, engaging, and reading scripture anew, discovering the joy of seeing what the authors were trying to convey. As simple as that sounds, church tradition has actually made it difficult. We are in the midst of success, and it's only the beginning. This episode is to orient our minds humbly on the task before us, on our successes and our struggles, and the decisions that we will face. We are not immune from the allure of hubris and pride. I was my dad's most faithful congregant. I attended church with him from birth to age 40, minus a few years for college. Rex wrote every sermon out entirely, including reminders to laugh. See, his childhood left him with scars that never fully healed. He had to write out his sermons just so he would feel confident in presenting them. <laughs> but the result? We have 50 years of my dad's sermons in binders. You'll see a picture of this sermon in the episode art. This recording of my dad was done in June of 2014. My dad was 76. He was speaking at the Troyview Church in Troy, Ohio. When I listened to it a few weeks ago, I was transported to my childhood, sitting in the pew and listening to my dad share his heart, passion, and research. As a child, I was amazed and riveted by this startling piece of history. As an adult, I recognized the layers and layers of lessons still contained herein. His was an exceptional mind and a humble heart. I heard well over 2,000 sermons from this amazing man, and I attribute my own ease in front of people and with communicating ideas. I attribute that to hearing Rex's well-constructed sermons week after week all those years. Since 1982, Dad preached this sermon 14 times in seven states. He made notes on his manuscript for each date and location. Again, it's in the episode art. He may have shared it with around 700 or so people over that time. I wish he was alive today so I could let him know that his thoughts on the Titanic are now being spread worldwide. In his last years, he knew I was thinking about having a podcast one day, but he died before this started. 
I so wish I could sit and talk with him about the amazing things that have transpired, the people I've met, the things they have accomplished, and to read him the amazing notes I get from people like you. He would have loved this. So now, Dad, here is your grand debut to a new audience, one that spans the globe. This morning, I'm going to talk about an unusual subject about an ocean liner called the Titanic, the ship that was called unsinkable. I presume that most of you are fully convinced that the Titanic disaster was the largest boat disaster of all history, but you would be wrong. The largest boat disaster that happened happened on the flooded Mississippi River. That's not my topic this morning, but I'm going to give you a few lines about the ship that sunk on the Mississippi. Any of you happen to know? The Sultana. Sultana. You're the first time I've ever asked and somebody knew. How do you happen to know that? I've heard you preach this before. Goodness. You've heard this sermon before. <laughs> the Sultana is the name of it. The uh, disaster took place when steamboats were very popular on the Mississippi. It was luxury travel. It was still, of course, in its infancy when that happened in the 1840s and 1867 and those years. The Sultana was outrageously overloaded. 2,400 soldiers, 100 citizens, and 80 crew members, more people than any one steamboat ever carried on the Mississippi. The boat was designed for 365 people, yet there were 2,500 on board. But this was Civil War prisoners who were being taken back home, and the boat owners were getting paid by each head. So the more soldiers they had, the more money they made, and everybody was anxious to get back north. And so 2,000-plus sick and diseased POW soldiers came aboard the ship with high hopes of north and home. However, hours later, it was all brutally gone. At 2 a.m., on a pitch-black, cloud-covered night, the overstressed boilers let go, and immediately hundreds were killed. That was by impact, by debris from the explosion. Others burned to death, and many hundreds of them, men, women, and children, perished in the swift current. The first realization of a disaster that had taken place was five hours later after the explosion, when bodies and some survivors began floating past Memphis. Somewhere between 1,585 and 1,700 people perished. The great ocean liner, the Titanic, claimed 1,500 lives, and so about 200 less people than the Sultana. Why isn't this tragedy common knowledge, as is the Titanic? One reason was that President Lincoln had been assassinated April 14, 1865, just about two weeks before the disaster. And thus the newspapers relegated this story to the inside pages, and uh, all the front pages were covered worldwide about the assassination of Lincoln. Of course, there was no television, there was no internet, and so the news just wasn't available, and it never got out to the general public. Of all ships in history, of course, the Titanic commands a mystique second only to Noah's Ark. In the late 1800s and the 1900s, it was an age of opulence, luxury. It's also a time of the Industrial Revolution. By 1840, the steam engine had transformed England into very sprawling industries. It was the time of the invention of the telephone. Remember the one where you crank? I had one in my house. <laughs> uh, electric refrigerators, Faraday's Dynamo, Marconi's wireless radio, Edison's electric light permitted industries around the world to begin working 24-7. I don't know if that was a good thing or not. The mode and the momentum of the late Victorian era could not be tempered. By the end of the century, the golden age became, as Mark Twain's famous epitaph put it, the Gilded Age, a period of pronounced money-grubbing, luxury and flamboyance with excess and success being interchangeable. It was just crazy. <laughs> 
self-indulgent luxury, pride, excessive wealth, of course, was now going to be represented like a castle in the Southampton, England harbor on April the 10th, 1912, and of course, that was the Titanic. Regarding money, Luke wrote, One of the multitude said to him, Teacher, bid my brother to divide his inheritance with me. But he said to him, that is, Jesus said, Man, who made me a judge or divider over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. I love how basic the Bible is. Uh, No skirting the issues, no double talk, no spinning of the subject. Our lives are not, nor ever should be, wrapped up, plain and simple, in money, in goods, or in investments. But the Titanic represented a titanic effort to lure the rich, fill the owner's coffers with grandiose profits. But their dreams sank in the middle of the ocean, 2.5 miles down. Jesus calls those who lay up treasures for themselves fools, especially if he is not rich toward God. Let's ponder the ship for a moment. An eerie thing happened in 1898. An author named Morgan Robertson concocted a fiction novel about a fabulous Atlantic liner, far longer than ever had been built. He filled it with rich and complacent people and erect on an iceberg on a cold April night. His fiction seems almost prophetic, and the book was called Futility. Fourteen years later, the Titanic was built. It had 66,000 ton displacement. Robertson, in his novel, had 70,000. The real ship was 882 feet long. The fictional one was 800 feet. Both vessels were triple screw and could make 24 to 25 knots. Both could carry 3,000 passengers and had only enough lifeboats for a fraction of the number of people aboard. Both sunk in April. Both struck an iceberg. But what did it matter? They were both labeled unsinkable. Yes, this author even said his ship would have been unsinkable. Robertson named his ship Titan, and of course the real one was Titanic. That's eerie. To think a man could write a book 14 years before and almost duplicate the real Titanic. The Titanic was 11 stories high from the waterline, four city blocks long, and had 16 watertight bulkheads. She could carry 3,000 passengers. The ship had a gymnasium, a swimming pool, a regulation racket court, palm verandas, Turkish baths, cooling rooms, massage parlors. It had a complete hospital, with operating rooms, barber shops, refrigerator rooms to keep live flowers. It had a dark room for photographers, not to mention several saloons, banquet rooms, solid oak furniture and paneling, chandeliers, and a winding oak staircase that was the center of attention. On her maiden voyage, she carried 4,000 bags of mail, 6,000 tons of coal, Each boiler required 650 tons of coal per day. The rudder alone weighed 100 tons, and each chain link on the anchor weighed 175 pounds. When this monster pulled out of the channel and engaged its three huge propellers, the suction drew the ship called the New Yorker from its moorings and snapped the steel cables then held it to the shore. Several people were almost killed in the flying cables, and the New Yorker was almost sucked into the Titanic. It was later learned that the sunken barge on the harbor floor had been drugged 800 yards across the bottom in the wake of this huge ship. She was called the ship that God himself could not sink. Let's take a moment to read something from Moses, This is from a paraphrase. At one time, the whole earth spoke the same language. So it happened that as they moved out of the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar, 
and settle down. They said to one another, Come, let's make bricks and fire them well. And they used bricks and stone for mortar. Then they said, Come, let's build ourselves a city and a tower that reaches to heaven. Let's make ourselves famous so we won't be scattered here and there across the earth. God came down and looked over the city and the tower the people had built. God took one look and said, One people, one language? Why, this is only the first step. No telling what they'll come up with next. They'll stop at nothing. I'll go down and garble their speech so they won't understand each other. Then God scattered them from there all over the world, and they had to quit building the city. That's how it came to be called Babel because their God turned their language into Babel. The tower had one design, to unite the people with one common object and to consolidate their selfish power. It was not designed to exalt God in any sense of the word, and he knew that. So God, understanding their spirit and their motive and their selfish plans being a rebellious people, he immediately determined to upset their foolish schemes. So God directly intervened and confused their language, the very thing that they had been building the tower to avoid, the confusion. Their pride, of course, was humbled. The Titanic was built to flaunt the latest genius in man. It represented all the finest in technology and skill of the time. They boasted, of course, as I've already said, God himself could not sink it. They learned differently, of course, as they did at the Tower of Babel. God will not be mocked. The Apostle Paul wrote, God is not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his own flesh will from his flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Praise the Lord for that. The pride of America and England sailed on that maiden voyage on April the 11th, 1912, carrying some of the wealthiest people in the world. Even the owner and the manager of the shipping line was on board. So confident were they of the ship. Three days later, in the middle of the Atlantic, their pride took a two-mile dive to the bottom of the ocean. The world was devastated. Hopefully many turned to God when they realized that they were not invincible. Unfortunately, tragedy sometimes is the only thing that will jar some to recognize and admit their mortality and their God. The Titanic had been warned five times of a massive ice flow in the path of their travels. At the Senate investigations later, they learned instead of slowing down or stopping for the night, as other ships had done in the area, the captain ordered two more boilers fired up. The false sense of invincibility and unsinkability They thought it could defy the ice. On Sunday night, April 14th, at 1140, near midnight, the Titanic collides with an iceberg. It cuts through six bulkheads on the starboard side. The ship could have stayed afloat with two bulkheads filled with water, but certainly not six of them. The engineers never imagined that six bulkheads could be destroyed all at once. Two hours and 20 minutes later, the ship sank out of sight in 31 degree water. People in lifeboats testified 250 feet of the stern rose straight up in the air, 25 stories high. Survivors testified it looked like swarms of bees clinging to the railings. And that, of course, was the 1,522 people who drowned or froze to death in the frigid waters. On Sunday following, Reverend Parkhurst of the Madison Square Presbyterian Church in New York said this, 
The picture which presents itself before my eyes is that of the glassy, glaring eyes of the victims, staring meaninglessly at the gilded furnishings of this sunken palace of the sea. Dead helplessness wrapped in priceless luxury. Everything for existence, nothing for life. Grand men, charming women, beautiful babies, all becoming horrible in the midst of the glittering splendor of a $10 million casket. The two sore spots, which readily run into one another and which constitute the disease that is gnawing our civilization, our love of money and passion for luxury. Those two combined are what sunk the Titanic and sent 1,500 souls prematurely to their final account, unquote. Regarding the lifeboats, on this maiden voyage to the United States, the Titanic was carrying 2,207 passengers. They had enough lifeboats and what we today would call inflatables, if filled to their legal capacity, could have saved 1,178, about half the number on board. As it turned out, only 713 people out of over 2,000 people were saved. In the 18 lifeboats near the ship, several demanded those in the boats that they returned to the people crying out for help in the terribly cold water. However, they were shouted down by other passengers not to return for fear of swamping their own lifeboat. It took about a half hour for the cries of those in the frigid water to fade away. Because nearly everyone had a life belt, their bodies remained afloat and would be spotted and picked up by ships 20 to 50 miles away from the scene for several weeks to follow. One cannot help but be filled with mixed emotions about this situation. Who knows what one of us would have done in the same dilemma. If they had rowed into the masks of terrified people, they quite possibly would have caused those in the lifeboats to drown as well. Based on the Senate investigations, however, those in charge of each lifeboat was generally labeled a coward and sternly rebuked. This is a delicate situation and a classic what-would-you-do problem that might have easy answers in a classroom, but it was another matter that night in the middle of the ocean. I won't presume to judge this or to suggest what I might have done, and I don't think any of us really could either. The scriptures teach that we are to count others greater than ourselves. We are to risk abuse to accomplish the right. We are told our devotion to God will cause men to hate us. But Jesus set the example and, of course, was hated too. We read in John 10 that Jesus willingly laid down his life, for he chose to obey God, knowing the horrible cross lay before him. And while giving our lives, we cannot compare exactly to the lifeboat situation. Yet there is this question we can ask, what should a Christian have done had he been in charge of one of those lifeboats? One boat held only five passengers, but it had the capacity to hold 70 people. I'll let you struggle with that question. The point I want to make is this, that we are taught by the Word of God and by example and the Scriptures to sacrifice ourselves before we would compromise God and his word or his son in any fashion. It was this kind of conviction of obeying God before saving self that Paul declared to some who were trying to save him from sure death in Jerusalem. Remember when Paul said, What are you doing in weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. The question remains, what would we have done in darkness, 
in the middle of the ocean? Well, I doubt that we can answer that question honestly, sitting here in air conditioning, comfortable seats, while not facing death. We come to the ship that is uh, sitting on the horizon called the Californian. It was visible from the Titanic, and the ship had shut down in the night like the Titanic should have done. The Titanic fired off eight flares, rockets, all of which were seen by the crewmen on the Californian. Twice the crewmen went to their sleeping captain and told him about the rockets on the horizon, and twice the captain rolled over and went back to sleep. During the Senate investigations later, they concluded that the ship could easily have gone to the Titanic and saved 2,200 lives. The captain later was publicly humiliated for his unconcern, for his lack of seamanship, and blatant disregard of common sea laws at the time, which stated that any rockets fired from any ship always was a distress signal. Well, you know, you and I see distress signals every day. They're called obituaries. And we have a ship, which is our Savior, that could save them in the turbulency of life. But do we just roll over and go back to sleep? The Apostle John wrote, If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need and shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? So like the Californian, it had the ability to help, but it didn't. John is saying if we have the ability to help someone find life, we must respond. And if we don't, God's love is not in us. I read from the Senate records. The submerged forecastle was now beginning to shudder, shaking very much as the sea poured into A and B decks, and flooded the first-class quarters, the lounges, and the saloons. Far astern, Father Thomas Biles and a German priest became the focal point of a frantic crowd of immigrants prepared to meet God, exclaimed Father Biles, and while many fell to their knees and began chanting the rosary, others dashed to the companionways and ladders. The gentleman's lounge on a deck continued to be a bastion of self-confidence, Men in evening clothes were still playing cards on grotesquely slanting tables. Liquor was on the house and available to all classes. Fireman Paddy Dillon stuffed a bottle of brandy into his jacket, careened out onto the deck, and fell overboard. The band, which was aboard, played ragtime for nearly two hours while people were running about trying to figure out what to do. And at the end, they played a hymn called Autumn, which was an Episcopalian hymn. Some of the words are, God of mercy and compassion, look with pity on my pain, hold me up in mighty waters, keep my eyes on things above, righteousness, divine atonement, peace, and everlasting love. The band played until they couldn't sit on their chairs, and then it was every man for himself. I don't know how we will face death, but I've never heard of anyone ever apologizing or asking forgiveness on their deathbed for being a Christian. As distasteful as this subject is, we nevertheless are confronted with death on every page of the Bible and all around us. Christians are forced to ponder death if they know their Bibles. God chose to do this for a reason. Because the bottom line of our lives is how to escape eternal death. So let's be prepared for that day. William Smith of Grand Rapids was the chief Senate investigator. He said, A state of absolute unpreparedness stupefied both passengers and crew. Unpreparedness, in one word, is the major cause of so great a tragedy. Many new laws were enacted on the heel of this investigation for the safety of passengers on cruise ships. No one could be held accountable in those days. No one could be sued for negligence. 
because there were no laws at the time regarding radio transmissions, obedience to rocket flares, lifeboat procedures, and the like. It was just a horrible tragedy, as Senator Smith said, of absolute unpreparedness. The spiritual lesson seems obvious. If we go down to eternal death, it's not because there were no laws governing us as we are alive. The Bible is the law. And if we live by God's teachings, we shall be saved from the wrath to come. In Luke 12, the parable of the rich farmer who was very proud of his accomplishments and so decided to build bigger barns to enlarge his portfolio, Jesus called the man a fool. Why? Because the man died the same night that he made the proud boast. We never know what the next day is going to bring, let alone the next hour. The man was absolutely unprepared for death. He was focused on the wrong things in life, worldly possessions instead of God, his real estate instead of God's son, growing in wealth instead of by faith. When John Jacob Astor was scooped from the water several days later, he was the famous multimillionaire at the time, the first ever multimillionaire. He was identified by his large diamond ring that had been set in platinum. He was, so to speak, thinking about his profitable barns instead of the brevity and the uncertainty of life by preparing for that by knowing God. And the farmer thought to himself, what shall I do? I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, "Ah, I'll do this. I'll pull down my barns and build bigger barns. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to myself, So you have ample goods and things laid up for many years, so take your ease and eat and drink and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? The farmer, talking to himself, was planning to prosper big time, for years to come. But Jesus reminded him, we don't know what tonight or tomorrow will bring. We all know that we live on a turbulent sea of life. Ask anyone who survived the tornadoes in Oklahoma or the fires in Colorado and all the other tragedies that go on around us. Who knows what the next hour will bring? Are you ready for any storms in your life? Any icebergs that might cross your path? A beautiful hymn has these words. Jesus, Savior, pilot me over life's tempestuous sea. Unknown ways before me roll, hiding rocks and treacherous shoal. Chart and compass come from thee. Jesus, Savior, pilot me. Is Jesus your chart and compass for daily living? Is Christ your captain? Is Jesus at the helm of your life? The Titanic has some Titanic lessons regarding our pride, our possessions, our mortality, our commitments, and our priorities. $4,000 in John Astor's pockets didn't help him at all, unless... He had had Christ in his heart. I'm eager to see what 2024 brings. Let this remind us to be humble and to seek God's wise counsel daily as this year unfolds. Write to me, podcast at unitarianchristianalliance.org. I love sharing bits of people's stories here in the mailbag, and it's encouraging for me when I hear from you. And it's encouraging for me when I hear from you. As you may have noticed, I produced way fewer podcasts in the last half of 2023 than any of us would have liked. It was a hard time for various reasons. I am encouraged by the increasing theological momentum, sure. But I'm most encouraged by you. Remember to reach out with your events to be listed on our UCA events page. I know we have more good things going on this year than are currently listed on the site. 
In March, it's a debate in Houston, Texas, between Dale Tuggy and James White on Is Jesus Yahweh? You can get tickets and actually be there. In July, as I've already mentioned, we are having our first overseas UCA conference, July 25 through 27, in Windsor, UK. Go to unitarianchristianalliance.org forward slash events to learn more about these and to learn how you can add your own to the list. I've met many of you who live in Europe already, but not in person. How about we fix this? I'm planning to be there, and I want to see you. Getting together and meeting others, it's orders of magnitude more encouraging than reading posts on Facebook or getting text messages. It's the in-person visit over a meal where we discover others with similar passions, learn about new efforts, or to create new efforts. This is how the UCA is contributing. We are creating opportunities that are possible because of our uniquely narrow and specific objectives. Since we are not a church, since we have no authority, which means we don't govern or manage other people's thinking, we are able to broadly reach and create connections with people from many backgrounds. This would be hard to do for an actual church or fellowship-based organization. They have their own priorities, and those priorities are more eternally significant than ours. This Unitarian doctrine thing, while significant for sure, I mean, it's part of the greatest commandment, it's not making disciples and reaching the world with the gospel. It's just helping by being a resource for those who do that labor. The UCA is a catalyst, a trigger, or a spark to provide more energy for truth. And there certainly is more truth than just the identity of our one God and His obedient, loving human Son. Every humble step towards truth is powerful. And for many of you, this one, this realization of the convolution of the Trinity, is merely the tip of the iceberg. (laughs) You will go on from here to do your real work in the world, to be Jesus to others, to teach, serve, and love. I'm just appreciative that you include this, our effort, into your busy lives, with your prayers, and sometimes with financial help. Thank you. Speaking of financial help, we have a few funds set up so that you can help out specifically in ways you feel most drawn to. They are the Publishing Fund, which goes directly to the production of new books from Theophilus Press, like the recent release Dynamic Monarchianism by Thomas Gaston. There's the Marketing and Advertising Fund, which will help put content in front of people and to produce more content. And by the way, that remarkable growth in the last month with new people seeing the YouTube content, that happened without spending a dime on advertising. That was organic growth. It was accelerated by people like you who shared these shorts and other content. Together, we created a new level of momentum. Thank you for that. Keep it up. Soon, we will be using the gifts to the Marketing and Advertising Fund to deliberately put some things out there. Exciting times, indeed. And then there's the International Conference Fund. This is a way to dedicate extra help to offset costs for these events overseas. It was hard enough getting a full UCA conference going in the States, where we had our entire board and lots of helpers able to work on it. New events in new places have a whole new set of challenges. And costs can be very problematic. The International Conference Fund can be your way of saying, Here, this is so important, let's make sure it happens and that it's affordable for others. The UCA UK International Conference coming up in July, it's going to be directly benefited by this fund. Again, thank you for your support. I and the rest of the Board of Volunteers are touched by your generosity. I'm excited to let you know that soon I'm going to be talking with a few members of the UK team about the upcoming European Conference. That roundtable episode should be a delight. I've had the joy of being in a few meetings with them, and it's about time I share the experience with you. Be watching for that. The UK has a lot of Christadelphian folks, and several are on this team. Great people with a passion for truth and serving others. If you can make it to the conference, you'll meet many of them. If you're in Europe, you are just a train ride away. Seriously, consider finding a way to come. Oh, speaking of the UK, that's where my previous guests, Dan Weatherall and Paul Davenport, live. I interviewed them on episode 16, Bible Feed Podcast. 
Dan does a great job with his podcast, and many of you have been enjoying his episodes covering a spectrum of biblical topics. And also in the works is a two-part interview with Josiah Wright. That's Josiah from way, way back in episode 20, The Good, The Bad, and The Boys' Home. That was April of 2021. If you were at the last UCA conference, you may have sat in Jacob Ballard's workshop on deconstruction. It's quite a trend in the world, as people, like never before, are leaving behind the faith they grew up with. In this case, Josiah went through a year of full-blown agnosticism, and he came back. He recounts the experience in detail, and hearing it will give you an appreciation for what is going on in many people's lives. Plus, you'll learn ways to help those who may be going through it. Much like the Titanic, it's less costly to learn from history and from others, when possible, rather than experiencing the pain firsthand. If you were thinking of catching up on a past episode, try episode 20 with Josiah Wright so that you'll know his backstory in advance of his upcoming interview. And I've got plenty more in store. I'm looking forward to another year of amazing stories, people, and maybe some more puppet shows. Dude, man, go take your nonsense somewhere else. Maybe so. If you were at the last conference and filled out the survey, we are reviewing that information this month and actively working on a plan for this year's conference. Keep tuned for updates. And if you're set up on the UCA website, helping to populate the massive spread of dots on our map, we email you each time we post news. Go to UnitarianChristianAlliance.org to join at no cost. If you aren't getting the UCA podcast newsletter, there's a link to sign up in the show notes here or on the podcast page, podcast.UnitarianChristianAlliance.org. In each newsletter, after giving additional info about the episode, I include a section on audio nerdery. Not a word, Mark. Okay, the audio geek corner. I'm going to walk through the audio cleanup process I did for this recording of my dad. It took a few steps to sound clean like you heard today, and the process included AI tools. I know, that makes me very hip. I'll tell you about it and include actual audio so you can hear the different stages of processing. It's good to be back. I'm excited for 2024, well, at least in terms of truth, theology, and faith. Maybe not so excited for the politics wars, and disasters. It's an exciting time to be alive. So, Dad, I guess I have to wait to tell you all about my exploits, sound effects, guests, and especially to tell you that your titanic efforts are now locked into the Internet for decades to come. I can't wait. See you at the resurrection, Dad. May God bless you in your truth pursuits. I hope this podcast serves you well.